I'm so pleased you're here on this nice warm day. Uh, perfect, perfect. <laughs> Uh, you know, what a, what, a, what a great day it is, and a great honor it is to have Omar with us here today, Omar Salem. i just uh, very briefly tell you this story. I was at the Berkeley Divinity School at Yale alumni luncheon, and I sat next to a young woman who works at Trinity Wall Street, where I was sponsored for ordination from, and she was from the Diocese of Arizona, where I used to serve, and so I was lost in deep conversation with her and then uh, I thought, oh my gosh, how rude can you be? I was all tunneled in on what was happening in Arizona and I turned to my left and as I turned to the left, Omer turned to his right and uh, I looked at him, we shook, our, shook hands and he said, hi, my name is Omar Salem and I thought, now this is gonna be a good story uh, and it is a good story and in a moment I'm gonna invite Omer up to tell it uh, about how it is uh, that in his life he has received such a calling uh, and what a blessing it is to have you here. So I want to begin with just a, just a prayer here. Lord, we give you thanks for the whole human family and uh, Missio Dei, the mission of God to bring it all together. And we ask that you bless us in our time together, that you bless Homer, and that you bless his three of his five kids who braved the cold with Pa this morning to be with us. We pray this in the power of your spirit. Amen. So, Omar, you've got a lot to say. Come, come and start saying, but please start off by telling them a little bit about yourself, okay? If you put that on your lapel, we'll all be able to hear you all the better. Great. Thank you. Oh, and you show them your book, too. But that's, I forgot it. Okay. All right. Well, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, uh, Omar Salim, a native of uh, Egypt. Now, th this is not... No, 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 no. That, that's for the video. Not, oh. And this is... So is, is, people can hear you now. Can hear me this from. is a very high-tech operation. Over. Okay. I'm telling All right. you, no messing around. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, so, um, like, um, first I want to thank uh, Reverend uh, Peter Walsh for having me here uh, this morning uh, at uh, at your church. And um, <clears throat> let me tell you a little bit about myself before I start. Uh, I'm, uh, like Peter mentioned, I'm a native of Egypt. I was born in uh, the famous uh, biblical city of Giza, where the pyramids are, those big picturesque pyramids that you see. Um, and um, finished my primary education there in public schools. Uh, then the whole family immigrated to America, to uh, the West Coast, San Francisco area, specifically Palo Alto, uh, in the late 70s. And uh, I went to school in America. Uh, my uh, undergraduate school was UC Berkeley. Um, graduated in engineering, and uh, <coughs> upon graduation, I continued. Uh, I started working in business and industry, <coughs> specifically in real estate. Uh, and then, uh, in my mid-career, I had a calling to do something about uh, the raging conflict in uh, the Middle East. Uh, uh, that tends to uh, be inflamed and then cools down to, to prepare for the next uh, inflammation, I guess. So I, I looked at that, uh, and this was actually, uh, by then it was uh, 2005, 2006 when I started really wanted to take a closer look at that conflict. And I said, you know, in order to really study that uh, conflict, I should really study um, uh, theology. I should really study religion. I should know more about what, um, <clears throat> what that newly found nation in the Middle East, uh, Israel, what, what that nation uh, believes in. Uh, because we have people in the Middle East who believe in Islam, and that's probably the majority of the Middle East. 90% uh, of the people who live there are, uh, or, or call themselves uh, Muslims. And uh, then uh, they seem to be having a conflict with uh, the state of Israel. So I said I would study uh, the Bible. And that what took me to uh, study at, at Yale, uh, at the Divinity School. Uh, where I studied the Old Testament and the New Testament. Upon graduation, I continued my studies and did a dissertation 
uh, a PhD dissertation on uh, Jews and Christians in the Quran in an effort to find peaceful ways to uh, handle the relationship between uh, the three Abrahamic religions, the three Abrahamic religion, because all three religions um, hail or, or stem from the patriarch Abraham. <clears throat> so having, uh, having done that, uh, I, I, uh, I went on to uh, speak and give talks and promote certain understanding of our respective books that would allow for uh, uh, really the message of God to be shared with the world and the, the message of peace because God in all three traditions is all about peace building and peacemaking and enjoying this life because life is temporary anyway I mean regardless of whether you live for 10 years or 100 years it's temporary with respect to infinity infinity meaning when it started, when it's going to end, I mean, it, it, and we're all guests here. We're all guests on this wonderful ship, planet called Earth. Uh, it's a spaceship that is part of a huge cosmos. Uh, and and uh, we are here to uh, enjoy it, really, and, and, and be happy and, uh, uh, and be... Uh, kind to, uh, to one another. So <clears throat> when I embarked on this journey, uh, I had to uh, go into the books that are most uh, revered by, oh, this moves, so that's good, I wanna, because I, I don't want to stay in one place. Uh, I wanted to study the books that are most important to uh, the Jewish people and also to Christians and to Muslims. So the book that's most important to the Jewish people is a book they call the Tanakh, which is a compilation of the first five books of Moses in addition to uh, about 34 other books, making 39 books in a book they term the Tanakh. They call it the Hebrew Bible. Uh, I had to study it from their perspective, what they think about, uh, about the book, not what others say about them. So uh, that was very important um, for me. I also uh, had the pleasure of studying uh, the Bible, uh, the, 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 uh, the Gospel of Jesus Christ, and the letters of Paul, and uh, the, the, you know, the 26 books that comprise the New Testament, the New Testament. <clears throat> um, and also I studied the Quran, which is really unique about this journey is that uh, uh, the, the Quran is the book that is most revered by Muslims. Uh, many of you have seen the Bible, uh, but uh, may, maybe very few of you uh, may have seen uh, the Quran, but this is what it looks like. This is the book that's most revered by uh, uh, Muslims. Now, <clears throat> having, uh, having done that, I, I distilled all this knowledge in three books that I put out. <clears throat> One of them is called The Struggle for the Holy Land. Because it's since the creation of the city of Israel 70 years ago, it's been uh, it, it has not we really did not experience much of a, a real peace. Uh, we, we, there are many people who are hoping for peace and working for it, but we really haven't ar arrived there yet. Another book I um, published is this book here. It's called uh, The Missing. Peace, and uh, it also takes the angle of of the role of religion in that conflict. And the third book I have is actually just came out. It's called Jerusalem: uh, Seek the Peace of Jerusalem. That's what it, the book uh, uh, looks like. 
And it, it deals with the role of religious leaders in the conflict and the importance of what religious leaders say that would help, um, uh, I guess, uh, bring peace or bring conflict. So that's what the book treats. Anyhow, having uh, made this long introduction, what I wanted to say that I'm part of an organization called the Light and Guidance for Peace, that what you see here on your screen. It's a nonprofit organization, public benefit, and um, it, it just uh, promotes ways to understand our respective texts uh, in a way that uh, we would uh, promote uh, peace building and peacemaking. Um, it's not a religious organization or a political organization. Uh, it does not speak for one side of the conflict. Uh, it's just an educational, educa educational uh, organization. Promotes it. What's our vision? Our vision is for the people of the Middle East to live, work, worship, and raise their children side by side in sustained peace and prosperity. Uh, sort of like what we have here in the United States. We have Jews, Muslims, Christians, and other religions. And uh, on Friday, Muslims can go and pray in the mosque. Sunday, we pray here in the church. And Saturday, the Jews go and pray in their synagogues. And we have an amicable model that, that really works for everyone and accommodates everyone. <coughs> So that's, that's the kind of vision that uh, I was inspired to, 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 to research ways to make that happen. So anyway, um, educate about the religion text. Oh, this is our agenda, is to respect and value others using their respective religious text. So when I speak to you, I want to be able to speak to you from the gospel of Jesus Christ, from what is most dear to you. And I... As a Muslim, I need to respect that. Respect what you respect. <clears throat> and um, all I do is ask for you to do the same thing with me, is respect what I respect, meaning that when you speak to me, I want you to know just a little bit about the Quran, what, what, what would make for a good relationship between me as a Muslim and you as Christians. Um, and. Uh, uh, there are, and you don't really have to know 114 chapters of text in the Quran, all you need to do is just one page that I'm going to point out here. Uh, and once you know that one, you'll be able to speak fluently to your Muslim neighbor and be uh, best uh, uh, friends, if you will. And that's really the hope of this. Um, I'm going to skip a few things. Now, this one is actually a verse from uh, the Quran that sets the stage for all of my work. And that is, it, it says that we are created from a pair of male and female and made into nations and tribes that we may get to know each other. Um, verily, the most honored of you in the sight of God, Allah, is he who or she who is the most righteous of you. So that's a, it's, a, it's a verse in one of the chapters in the Quran which um, illustrates that God intended for us to be different um, tribes and different nations and different languages, different religions. It's all part of the big plan. Okay? Uh, there are other verses in the Quran that says if God has willed it, He would have made us all Christians or all Jews, or all Muslims, or all Hindus. But that's not God's plan. God's plan is that um, we be different to test certain things that in God's infinite knowledge, He wants to test in us as believers. He wants to test our patience. He wants to test how close we are to the teachings that are brought to us by our respective prophets. Um, to get to know each other, yeah, that's that's the main topic here. Um, so, 
how do we define the relationships? So, as long as our relationship is defined by our differences, we will empower these things. Those who sow hatred rather than peace, those who sow and promote conflict rather than cooperation. So, what's the alternative to that? If we define our relationship by our similarities, we will empower those who sow peace rather than hate, those who promote cooperation rather than conflict. Um, and that would, that's what would lead to prosperity and so forth. Um, so, uh, <laughs> I put this image here to show you what's going on in, 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 in this debacle in the Middle East and, and why it lasted so long. You got people who call themselves Palestinians, they're surrounded by Arabs, and the Arabs, so the Palestinians, they influence the Arabs, the Arabs influence the Muslims. Uh, the next circle, oh, this is a map of what the, mo the Muslim world, this is areas where it's like either Muslim majority countries or Muslim countries with big Muslim populations. Um, and as you see, uh, it covers a major part of the world. There is like a billion and a half uh, Muslims out there. Uh, and as you see, uh, if you see Israel is just like right embedded right in, in, in the middle of the Muslim world, the, the place of Israel, uh, Palestine, um, between Egypt and Syria down in, the, in, that, in that map. Um, on the other hand, uh, here is, now uh, again, this is simplistic, uh, it's not detailed, it doesn't go to Shias, Sunnis and other sects and all that, but it just gives you a general idea of where Muslims are in the world. Uh, on the Israeli side, we have the Israel Jews, and then we have the evangelicals who really, really support Israel wholeheartedly, regardless of what Israel does. And then you have Christians all over the world uh, who are, of course, uh, the, the bigger segment of, you know, uh, where, where Christianity, where evangelicals are part of. And this shows the Christian world. This is a map, but it just breaks in between, you know, Catholics and Protestant and Orthodox in Russia and so forth. Um, so this is the world that we live in, in terms of different religions and different faiths. Um, now, today, uh, there are certain terms that one can, uh, to, or adjectives that one can use to describe Muslim-Christian relations, and unfortunately that, uh, you know, some of these adjectives are, uh, it, it, the relation is tense, I, let me just be honest, I, I cannot just sugarcoat anything. There is a tense relationship. There is, um, uh, okay, I put four adjectives here. Strained, tense, edgy. That is, that is really, this is the reality of the world that we live in today. And I'm gonna get to the root cause of that. Why, why this tense relationship? Um, and then also how to overcome that, because we, uh, Okay, well, certain slides here talk about root causes and so forth. I'm not going to skip them because there are so details. And, uh, okay, and then I'm going to jump to the, com the, 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 the center of gravity in Jerusalem. Because Jerusalem is very, very dear to the Muslim world. Yet, it is also dear to Jews and Christians. One cannot deny that. And... The importance of Jerusalem, uh, I guess, it has been for 1,300 years uh, ruled or surrounded by people who adhere to the Islamic faith. Okay, for 1,300 years, that was the case. From, 19, from, from 632 up until, you know, the British came and, 1917, it was part of uh, the Muslim world or surrounded by people who adhere to the Islamic tradition. Now, we all know that Jerusalem is also very important to uh, Christianity and Judaism. Now, the Jews say, well, this is our, 
main city in the world. This is our capital. This is our uh, this is a this is a place that we worship towards and so forth. And uh, Christians worldwide back them in that claim, which is which is perfectly fine. That's that's where Jesus had his ministry for three years. Um, that's where the temple was. So there is a huge history there in that in that city. Now. Muslims don't want to give it up uh, because they feel that it takes away something from the religion to give it up. Okay, it, in reality it doesn't really, but they somehow were taught that it's important for the religion. Um, although it's more of a political struggle, at least in my mind as a, as a researcher. <coughs> Um, the Jews covet Jerusalem because they say we pray to Jerusalem. We uh, had our prophets Solomon, David, all the major biblical prophets were in Jerusalem. Um, Christians, specifically, you know, evangelicals say, well, you know, we should really support the Jews in uh, in having in, in, in acquiring that city and having the city as their capital and so forth, and uh, they go uh, they go further than that. They say, well, we should really build the third temple. They, we we want to build the third temple there uh, because when we do that, Jesus will come back again. And uh, according to the Book of Revelation, when he comes back again, uh, uh, Jews going to have to make a choice: they either embrace Christianity or you know uh, they'll be destroyed. So you got all these, you know, those are the stories that are uh, out there for everybody to, to contemplate and hear and so forth. Um, and uh, the Jews are saying, look, I mean, all we want to do is, is be able to worship on the Temple Mount, the Temple Mount. And the Muslims are preventing us from worshiping on the Temple Mount. And the Muslims are saying, well, this is all, this is Islamic uh, holy site. We can't let the Jews <laughs> come and worship here um, because it, 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 it disgraces our, uh, our holy site. Okay, so I'm, I'm just giving you all the different aspects of, of the struggle, actually. It is, it is, it is, it is really a, uh, a struggle, um, which uh, there are definitely ways to handle it and ways to solve it. Uh, unfortunately, we are... Uh, going about it, my view, the wrong way, but I'll, I'll explain that later. Uh, so this is uh, Jerusalem and the struggle over Jerusalem is causing a strain in Muslim-Christian relations, okay? Uh, and the, uh, so, you, so you get this uh, extremist Muslim... Um, clerks, sheikhs, imams, who say, wait a second, uh, we, now we, wh what we're going to have to do is now equate Christians and Jews with a term in Arabic called kafir. Uh, and and, and it's, a, it's a very, uh, it's a derogatory term, but it's, a le it's also lethal. Because if an extremist Muslim terms someone a kafir, then he is obliged, based on his uh, book, the Holy Quran, to fight you, to fight you. He has to, because it's defined that way. Now, what, what's, the good news is about the Quran is that he, it does not say that all Christians and all Jews are kafir, but it says that the ones who actually truly follow Jesus Christ are not kafir. Uh, the, the, the Jews who follow the Ten Commandments and what Moses, peace be upon him, came with, they're not kafir. But it's this generalization. It's just like saying oh, all Muslims are terrorists. Muhammad is a false prophet. He is a madman. He is this. So, so you get you get diatribe going back and forth between uh, two traditions who have who stem from the same origin and have many many similar roots. And in fact, the Gospel of Jesus Christ and also the Torah, which is the five book of Moses and all the other books, are revered in our book. 
They're revered here in the Quran. They're mentioned in very high regard in the book. But when conflict strikes, here's what tends to happen. You get the extremist Muslims who say, yeah, yeah, they are revered here in this book, but you know what? They have been changed. People have changed them. So the people who are here today, they're not following the teachings in those books, and that's why we call them the other. We call them heretics, kafir, that sort of thing. Uh, so, so that's really how the, the conflict is, 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 is raging. And the problem is that you get young uh, uh, children in theological schools who are being taught uh, that, uh, yes, Christians and Jews were good at one point, but since Muhammad appeared in Arabia and proclaimed his message, those who did not follow that message are no longer uh, saved by God. Okay, so you're no longer saved if you don't say the Shahada La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Um, now the Quran doesn't say that. But they make, unfortunately, they make the Quran to say that. The Quran really says something very, very important. And that's the part that I want you to know and be able to share with your uh, Muslim who doesn't know. And because many, many, many Muslims just they hear it from their uh, Imam or Sheikh and that's it. Then it becomes uh, fact. They don't really go into. Uh, researching what the Quran truly says. But what it really says, what the Quran says is that in chapter number five, verse number 48, it says, God has given a book to each people, to each tribe, to each nation. And, and they will be judged based on that book. They will not be judged on the Quran that I'm giving you, O Muhammad. So the message to Prophet Muhammad it has two parts. Part for people who never received anything, which were the nomads, the Arab nomads, who did not have a prophet before, did not have the Israelite prophets that we are all familiar with. Um, and to those, God gave them the Quran and said, okay, just follow what the teachings in this Quran and you'll be fine. And then there was another message for people of the book, which is you, Christians, and also the Jewish people. They're called people of the book. Now, people of the book means that people who have a book that they respect, that they study, that they live by. And to those people, there's a special message in the Quran. And that message is, you will be judged based on your book. And then God goes to say that there are going to be differences between the Sharia law that Muslims are judged by and the laws that are... Uh, that the, Jews call it halakala, okay, so that they have their own, uh, if you will, sharia law. And Christians have their own laws as well based on the gospel. So God goes to, uh, to acknowledge that and say, to each of you I have given a path and a way. I have given a sharia law, if you will. And there's going to be differences between those laws. And what I want you to do is be patient with each other because you will not solve those here. It's going to be on the day of judgment that you'll know what from what. In other words, all of you are going to come one day, not in this life, but in the next. And God is going to be the one who says what is uh, uh, right and what is wrong, based on your own book, not based on my book or somebody else's book. So, you, for example, you're not judged based on what's in the Old Testament, what the Jews are judged on. You're not expected to observe the Sabbath the way the Jews do. For example, the Jew cannot drive a car on the Sabbath. They don't even turn the light switch or heat something in the kitchen on Saturday. That's what the rabbis say. But you're not held to that standard. They don't eat, you know, they, they, they have laws, you know, kashrut laws, where so many things they don't eat. If you go to a Jewish kitchen, you find two refrigerators, two sinks, two dishwashers. Why? Because they have a commandment in the book of Exodus that says don't mix milk and meat. So, well, that's fine. They're applying that. They're judged based on that. Uh, the same way Muslims have 
uh, uh, their main gathering days is Friday, for example. They don't worship on Sunday. They, they worship on Friday. So each nation, each people, and it's set in a stone in the Quran saying that it, you are judged based on what you have. Now, if we um, want to have uh, peace between people, we should uh, allow, we should really apply what uh, Jesus Christ said in, in, in you know, in his uh, Sermon on the Mount, you know, love for others what you love for yourself. Uh, allow others to worship the way they best know how, just like you want to worship the way best you, you know how. Um, uh, the uh, <clears throat> so, so I'm going to go back to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is at the center of, 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 a, of a conflict, um, and uh, Muslims claim it for themselves. Christians claim it for the Jews. So that and that's really um, uh, making it uh, difficult for the relationship between the two. Let me see if I have. Uh, okay. So, all right. So. Yeah, there is a big problem. What to do with the Jewish people? We know from the history of Europe that Europe had certain challenges with the Jewish people, culminating with what happened in the Holocaust. Okay? Uh, they were not only murdered in Germany, they, they, they were turned in, in in Poland, they were turning them in. In, in other places, they were uh, turning the Jews in for the, to the Nazis which means that it is not really a German Jewish problem. It was bigger than, than just one locality, one nation uh, that had, uh, had that uh, uh, problem. And the Jews came to Palestine because of the partition plan and so forth. And they wanted to have a place to, under the sun like everyone else. There is ample text in the Quran to accept the Jews. There is ample text for us as Muslims, to accept them and allow them to have a place and, and protect them from persecution, okay? Christian Europe, let's be honest, did not like the Jews, okay? They just wanted to just get rid of them. It's, it's reality, we can't really deny that. And it's not, it has nothing to do with the Holocaust. I mean, before that we had uh, the Inquisition in Spain, we had the pogroms in Russia, I mean, there is just a history there. So, uh, Jews, you know, were supported to come and be in Palestine. That's, that's great, that's wonderful. And uh, I wish that uh, the rulers in my part of the world, or the Muslim rulers, uh, looked more closely to the text in the book and less to politics. Because the, the trend, the, what took place is that they thought of Jews as colonizers, as imperialists, as people coming to oppress other people, take their land and all that. And that's really what caused the conflict to continue to go, to go on. If they viewed the people as people running from danger and running for cover and wanting just a place to be and stay and raise their kids and so forth, they would treat them a whole lot different. But unfortunately, that is not uh, promoted as much, that these were people who were persecuted for many, many years, and now they have a place that they can call home, uh, raise their kids, and they're willing to uh, trade land for peace, they're willing to do so many things. Um, uh, so, so anyhow, that's what we need to do, is just focus on, um, if we focus on the part of of, of what uh, the Jewish people went through, then it makes it easier for us to accommodate them and let, have them live there and live in peace and so forth. Uh, and let uh, God judge the differences because there's always gonna be differences. Let's face it, I mean, Jews rejected Jesus. They said, no, no, the one who came is not the right one. We're waiting for another one to come, okay? Uh, God acknowledged that in the Quran, say that they did reject Jesus, they rejected his mother, they rejected all that. Okay, but what I want to do is hold my Jewish neighbor to the good ethics and morals in his own book. That's really what I want to hold him to, not to what's in my book. Because if I hold him to what Jesus said, he says, well, I don't acknowledge Jesus. 
If I, told, if I hold him to what Muhammad says, tell him, no, no, I don't acknowledge Muhammad. Okay, I have nothing to do with those. So the best thing to do, I would hold him to what is in his own book, chapter you know, 27 of Deuteronomy, has uh, so much of the morals and ethics that one should live by, and, and I can definitely uh, bring that to his attention and, and live in peace with my Jewish neighbor. Uh, my Christian neighbor, I can hold him to what's in uh, chapter 5 of the book of Matthew, for example, the Sermon on the Mount. I mean, if, if we just apply that one chapter, we will all be living in heaven on earth. In heaven on earth. We would have heaven here before we have it anywhere else. Um, the same way for Muslims, and that's the last thing I want to mention before I conclude. There is one chapter in the Quran, it's actually it's chapter number 49. And it's just a couple pages, just two pages of this, 600 pages. If Muslims live by those two pages, and I, and I actually put it on my Facebook page, I said, Muslims, we don't need you to memorize this whole, I mean, you see you have Muslims memorizing this whole 600 pages by heart. Okay, this is Arabic text that's hard for most of us to read anyway. But they not only uh, read it, they memorize the whole book. Um, and I said, on my Facebook page, just memorize these two pages and apply them. You will have heaven on earth, because they're, they mimic so much of what Jesus Christ said in, in the Sermon on the Mount, here in, in the Quran. Um, so with that, I uh, uh, can actually move to, um, uh, you know, question and answer session, uh, and ask if any of you has have, have, have questions on what I mentioned so far. Um, and um, uh, in the next week, I will be talking about a concept I explained in my book called Dignitism and how that is the basis for peace between uh, Christians and Jews, Christians and Muslims, and uh, how it can be applied. So. The, but uh, before I conclude, I wanted to ask you if any, any of you have, yes, please, you have a question. Could you give a good, the name of a good translation of the Quran, an adequate translation, because there's so many. And Thank you. They all read quite differently. Yes. Um, well, Marvin, just to repeat the question so everybody can hear that. Yes. Um, uh, the question is, can you give the name of a good translation of the Quran? Good translation of the Quran. Um, there is a translation by a scholar called Muhammad Ali. Okay, uh, sort of like similar name to the <laughs> the famous athlete in the United States, and that's a translation by the, the Quran, Muhammad Ali translation. Uh, but next time when I come on Sunday, I will bring copies of those as a gift and you can have them. Okay. okay? So, yes, by all means. Uh, you're right, you know, much of the problems we're having are really in the translations. Much of the problems we're having are in the translation. When you start translating the, the Gospel of Jesus Christ from Greek to English or to Chinese or to any language, uh, and you have so many translations, and people say, oh, wait a second, uh, this translation is saying this and that translation is saying that uh, which is the right one um, the same way for all, all books you lose so much in, the translate, in, in translating and that's why I said you know, if you really want to know what Jesus said read Greek you know, yeah, learn it, read it <laughs> um, and uh, uh, if you want to learn uh, if you want to know what Moses really said read Hebrew uh, start studying Hebrew and read it in its original text. Translation is just the best effort by someone who said, I think I know what he said. <clears throat> so anyway, uh, any other question? Uh, yeah, please. I read a history book years ago that said for thousands of years in the Middle East, there's been a turmoil and that's what has created tribalism, which goes beyond religious Okay, yeah. Um, 
Okay. Actually, uh, yes, there has been, there's always have been uh, feuds or conflicts, what have you. However, the feud, the, the present day feud between Arabs and Jews uh, is, is not as old as people think. And that's one, that's one thing I wanted to really emphasize. Um, Arabs have always looked at Jews as co-religionists who just happen to have a different Sharia law. We have our own Sharia law, the Jews have their own Sharia law. And that's okay, we can live in peace together. And if you study the history of Jews under uh, Christian Europe versus under Islamic uh, rule, for example, you will find that the incident of conflicts between Muslims and Jews are much less and much less significant than it had been between the church and the Jews. Like, for example, we've never had something like the Inquisition or the pogroms or the Holocaust against the Jews, per se. Uh, we had, you know, skirmishes here or there or something, but uh, they, they, they don't culminate into big events. And the reason is, um, Jews and, Jews and Arabs, and Arabs uh, are really the core part of what Muslims are. Uh, they're Arabs. Um, because this text is in Arabic, so it's easy to read. Once you're an Arab, you read this, then you say, oh, okay, so God, this is God's message, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll embrace that. Um, both of them are um, absolute uh, monotheists. In other words, they don't have the triune God. They just God is one and absolute and no images of God. Uh, so they unite in that, in that thought. In Arabic, they call it Tawheed, Ahad in, in Hebrew. So that in itself tends to diminish much of what can be a source of conflict. What tends to be a source of conflict between Christians and Jews historically Thank God there isn't much of that going on. But historically, it's because in the mind of some, you know, uh, Christians, uh, Jews killed God, okay, or killed the Messiah, or did this. So, so that can was used in Europe to inflame, inflame uh, the people to go and do certain things to the Jews, especially around Easter time in France and Italy and all in uh, Central Europe and all that, where they would bring a rabbi to the church, slap him in front of the congregation, <clears throat> spit on him, kick him out, and tell him, we don't want to see you or your people for three days. That's during the time when, <clears throat> the Easter three days. And if they catch a Jew during those three days, they kill him. So that, th those, this is, these are facts in the books. I mean, they, you read the history of Europe, you find these things. Um, but in, in Islam, they don't have that because they think that Jews, okay, they have Moses, and Moses is revered here, so we're, we're fine. They're... However, politics have colored all that after the creation of the state of Israel, unfortunately. And they're not looked at as the Jews that are mentioned in the Quran. They're looked at as colonizers and people who want to grab somebody else's land and steal and kill and maim and all those things. So, thank you. So, um, oh wow, we just really hit the meat here. Uh, and so I hope you come back next week to continue to, to chew on the meat. Uh, and uh, peace to all of you and peace to you. Um, thank the, you. The, the bell has tolled, which means these folks have a to-do list. Uh, and, but thank Omar, God bless you and thank you so much. And thank we will you. see you again next week. Right? Okay. Thank you.